the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You're getting tired of fruit salad every Sunday morning. I hope not, because the fruit of the Spirit is such a powerful image. What we're called to produce, what we're equipped to produce, what we're empowered to produce, if we remain connected to the Holy Spirit. So this morning we go to the last three. Now, let me give you your Bible quiz du jour here. Where was Galatia? What modern part of the world was Galatia in? Do, 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 Turkey. Oh my goodness, folks. This is why I feel like I'm preaching on this for so many weeks in a row. Not so you can just say, oh, I heard that last week or the week before the week before that. And who wrote the letter to the church in Galatia? I can't hear you. Paul. Very good. And what kind of mood was he in? Happy? No, he was a little ticked off, right? Because the Jewish Christians had said to the Christians who were coming in from the Gentile world, no, 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 no. If you want to come to Christ, you've got to come our way, which means through the law. All 613 tenets of the Torah, especially that big one, circumcision. Paul was mad, and he said, I'm going to say it again, if you're going to circumcise yourself, you might as well castrate yourselves for all it does for your faith because what we're talking about here is reliance on the grace of God in Jesus Christ. And then he says, the fruit of the flesh, or the, the life in the flesh, not meaning your body necessarily, but giving in to your desires, your more base self, or what? What were those things that we're saying by contrast the fruit of the Spirit is? What were those other things listed? Remember any of them? Nope, that's the fruit of the Spirit. But the other, the other side of that was what? Greed envy, factions, dissensions, sexual immorality, sorcery, debauchery, licentiousness, all those things that deny knowing Christ. So here we are this week. Now the first week I asked you to give me some definitions of love, joy, and peace. That was hard. Last week I asked you for the opposites of patience, kindness, generosity. Today is faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. What I'm going to ask you to do is, I want some volunteers, so you've got to think on this one. Use them in a sentence, not together. Somebody use faithfulness in a sentence. We just had one for the call to worship and the hymn. <laughs> Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. That comes from Lamentations. What do you know about Lamentations? Who wrote Lamentations? Anybody know? We have to do some serious Bible study in this congregation, I do believe. Who wrote the book of Lamentations? Jeremiah the prophet, the bald guy who's always painted his bald because he's always pulling his hair out because he's so frustrated with people's stubbornness. I always tell people who tell me I'm so upset, I'm so downcast in my spirit, I can't even pray anymore. I said, read the <laughs> Psalms. Not those happy Psalms, but the ones that say, how long, O oh Lord? O oh Lord, I feel like a worm. Oh, I'm a dog. Oh Lord, I'm down, I'm out. If that doesn't work for you, read the Lamentations of Jeremiah, because they are really the, woe is me. Woe is me, Lord. How long will you let me suffer before I die? Now, Jeremiah is also the prophet who then wrote these words. Thy steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Meaning that God will not change no matter what happens. That's what faithfulness is. Where else are we faithful? You're faithful to God, I hope, in your prayer life, in your devotional life, in your service life. Where else are you faithful? Your husband, your wife. Very good. That's a word we use in the wedding service in the United Methodist Church. Be faithful to one another. Not just sexually faithful, but faithful in terms of cherishing one another. Which comes to some of those other words. Who's got a sentence for self-control? That ought to be easy. I left my self-control in San Francisco. No, that's my heart. Who's got a sentence with self-control? You can come up with one of those. Pete, help us Jesus. What are you going to say? That was a twofer. I'm faithful to my wife, but she tests my self-control. I did, and you volunteered. I love you, Pete. He said this morning, I don't think she likes me anymore. No, I love you, Pete. That was great. Self-control. What are the arenas of life that you have a little trouble with self-control in? Chocolate. Oh, chocolate? 
Chocolate is a way of life. It's, it's a gift. <laughs> the word chocolate means gift of God, right, Thea Bromo? Gift of God. Don't, don't ever look a gift of God. Okay, never mind that one. Self-control. What are the arenas where self-control is difficult for you? Chocolate is one. What are other substances that people have trouble saying no to? What? In traffic. Oh, yes. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. I drive, and the things that come out of my mouth, my mother one day said, what if you slip and say that in a sermon? I said, well, they don't cut me off in sermons, usually. <laughs> but I am, I am open with my sin. I will tell you, I say some words that would just not be happy words if you heard them. that come out of my mouth. Sometimes I've told you, while well, I'm praying, I'm praying as I'm driving down the road. I often pray, I pray. God, protect the other people from me. Protect me from the other people driving. I pray that every time I get in the car. West Virginia is God protect me from the deer, protect the deer from me. And that I'm finding in Baltimore County going through Worthington Valley is still a worthwhile prayer. I'll be saying, God bless so-and-so. And I'm like, get out of my way, you person. <laughs> I find myself doing that. That is a lack of self-control. Where else is self-control needed in the world and lacking? Alcohol. Alcohol. Drugs, both prescription and non-prescription. Um, I'm not allowed to take tramadol anymore because the doctor in the Winchester Medical Center in the emergency room thought I was addicted to it because it, all the medicines from my last surgery on my first knee replacement were still listed. He said, what are you doing on all this stuff? I said, I'm not on it. I had a prescription for 20 tramadol tablets to last over six months. And he thought I was addicted and sent that to my health insurance. I'm no longer allowed to take Tramadol and will fill it for me. And the real sad part about that was the very next day I was hosting an opioid summit in my congregation, and I am now considered to be an opioid addict because of one doctor's misreading of a piece of paper. But we know that opioids have addicted people and ruined lives, so I understand their concern. What other arenas of life does self-control play out in? How about the political world? Gambling. Gambling. Amen to that. I once had a superintendent call me and say, could you please pay my housekeeper's mortgage for her? And I said, that's a lot of money. And she said, if she goes home one more time and has spent her entire paycheck on lottery tickets, her husband will probably kill her this time. Please pay it for her. So we gathered the money together and paid it for this lady. Can ruin a life. Amen. 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 How about in the political world? Is there a lack of self-control anymore? We can't agree to disagree anymore, can we? We have to just make it vicious and nasty and mean-spirited. Freedom of speech is being taken from us? How so? And I'll tell you, it's the other way, too. you got to admit, it goes both ways with that. But my speech, like, I can't, like, I was talking to my son about the gay time I had. He said, you can't say that word. And what's wrong with the gay time I had? I write it on this book. Okay. Here's another one for you to use in a sentence. Gentleness. This is a toughie. I want someone to use gentleness in a sentence. Toby. She cared for her child with gentleness. You know when you hear the word gentle used a lot? If a mother is handing her newborn to her three-year-old or a puppy to a five-year-old, what do they say? Be what? Gentle. Be gentle. Be gentle. Lots of times kids don't even know what that word means. You had trouble with it when I asked you to use it in a sentence. Gentleness. Is gentleness, how would you define gentleness? Is it strength or weakness? Strength. Right answer, because you thought I would say wrong answer if I said it was a sign of weakness. But how do we treat it in our society? We treat it as a weakness, right? If you're gentle, if you're mild-mannered, if you're soft-spoken, you're a wimp, right? Not necessarily in our way of thinking, but in the world's way of thinking, pretty much so. No one wants to be seen as gentle. You know any gentle politicians? What happens if you're a gentle politician? What do you get called then? Hmm? 
you don't get elected on your gentleness. You know, vote for so-and-so, he's gentle, right. Now, we got into a discussion of toilet paper at the first service. We won't go there again. But look at gentle being used in advertisement. Isn't it? You know, this toilet paper is gentle. This shampoo is gentle. This cleanser is gentle. We don't like using it for people, do we? Now, the gospel lesson that we read this morning that, that Jerry read for us is the one from my funeral service. Immediately came to mind when I, I didn't have to look up gentle. You know, usually I go to the lectionary. When I'm off the lectionary, I go to the, the um, what's it called? Not the thesaurus, the, oh, I can't think of it. Bible Gateway is one, where you look up a word and it shows you every place it is in scripture. Concordance, concordance is the word. Oh, I love being my age some days. I will go on and look up the times it appears in scripture, but two came to mind. This is the first. This is going to be read at my funeral service. I'm going to read it to you again. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come to me, all you who are heavily burdened, and I will give you rest. Anybody here ever felt a little burden on your shoulders? And he says his yoke is light. Now, the reason I wear, when I wear my vestments, the stole is to symbolize the yoke of Christ, being what goes around your neck that keeps you focused in the right direction. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. This is someone who went to the cross for our sake, saying, come to me, I am gentle and humble in heart. Would you call Jesus weak? No, I don't think so. Would you call Jesus ineffective? I don't think so at all. But gentleness is being like Christ. All these things are being like Christ, being connected to the Holy Spirit. Now, in the political world, another passage came to mind this morning, and I've preached on this one before, when it comes to gentleness, and I want you to hear this one. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Think about that a moment in the political realms. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting of the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. What's the hope that is in us? I know that one, right? The hope in us is Jesus Christ. Am I right? He's the cause of our hope. He's the cause of our joy. He's the cause of our peace. He is the one who did all these things for our sake and for the sake of the world. And in him, we have all that we could ever hope for, ever want, ever need. This is our hope, and we have to be able to tell people what our hope is but with gentleness and respect. That's the hard part, isn't it? Gentleness and respect. Anymore, we seem to be moving toward in our country a way of saying, my way or the highway, right? We're going to enact laws that say you're going to do this, 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 and this, 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 and this, and this. A lot of those things are seen as Christian. I told you before about the man who came to my church one Sunday and listened to a sermon of mine. He came up to me when it was over, and he said to me, seems to me that you don't agree with prayer in schools. And I said, I don't agree with forced prayer in school. You gotta understand that that law was passed in 1963. I began elementary school in 1964, and we still prayed before we ate every day. Did we really pray at that age? No, we did not pray. We recited words. And to say that prayer in schools is the answer to everything. What we need is prayer in schools. I've heard that again. What we need is prayer in schools. No, we need to pray for schools. Four schools. If the people of God and Jesus Christ would pray every day of their lives for the protection of our students, our teachers, our faculties, our staff, if we would become involved in the day-to-day -day needs of these children and their teachers, we would have a different world. How many of you can honestly say you pray for schools every day? I don't either. I don't. I try to remember to do it. I pray almost every day for the schools, but I don't pray every day for the schools. Someone called me Madeline Murray O'Hare one day. That was this man in my congregation. I'm not at all like Madeline Murray O'Hare. I do not believe that at all. But I don't want the schools to have the responsibility to pray with my children. We should be praying with our children in our homes. We should be teaching them to pray. Because what would happen if the teacher that your child was assigned to was a Muslim? Would you want that person leading your children in prayer? Or someone from another faith tradition, was that what you want? Or even Catholics, what if they prayed to the Virgin Mary? Would you like that? Probably not. This man came up to me and he said, it sounds like you don't believe in prayer in schools. And I said, I really don't think prayer should be forced from anyone. Prayer is a natural 
speaking to God that comes out of a heart of faith. Shouldn't be coerced or legislated. He said, huh. I said, well, what prayer would you have them praying? He said, the Lord's Prayer, of course. And I said, I'm from Baltimore County, Maryland. So I was in West Virginia. I'm proudly from Baltimore County, Maryland. I said, where entire school systems are Jewish. Should they be forced to pray the Lord's Prayer? And he said, of course they should. We're a Christian nation. No, we're not a Christian nation. Not under the Constitution, anyway. But it's easy to say, if you do that, then this will happen, right? There is no gentleness, no respect in that. But the opposite can be true. I know I talk sometimes about my husband, probably a little more than I should. But I was teaching the Alpha Course. Anyone here ever take the Alpha Course or familiar with the Alpha Course? I think he did it at this congregation years ago. It's an introduction to the basic tenets of Christianity. The heart of the Alpha Course is when people say crazy stuff and people who are exploring different faith traditions say crazy stuff. People come and say, well, I believe in reincarnation. You don't say, that's wrong. Why would you say that? Stop it. You don't try to fix them. You say, tell me more about where you came to that belief. I was teaching this class when my husband was diagnosed with this terminal condition. A woman who had been in the class, who had not yet decided she wanted to be baptized or really profess her faith in Jesus Christ, came to me. And she said, I think I'm ready to be baptized. I said, what changed your mind? She said, I want what you have. I want what you have. I said, what do you mean what I have? And she said, I want faith that is unshakable. I want to believe in God no matter what I face in my life. And you do, and I want what you have. I said, there's plenty of it to go around. And we talked, and she was baptized. But if you stand up and say, this is what you must believe, you must say this in these words, it is not gentleness or respectful. It is not what brings people to God and Jesus Christ. So we can try to legislate our Christian way of life on people, or we can live it better. That's what's going to change somebody's heart. It's not going to be what you tell them they must do. It's going to be how you live your life, what they see in you that they think they want for themselves. That is what brings someone to Jesus Christ. Think about who led you to Jesus Christ. Did you come out of fear, or did you come running to the grace of God when you look at your Savior whose arms were wide open for you? who said to you, come to me if you're heavily burdened. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls. Not about your soul. My soul could use a little rest these days. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, generosity, gentleness, self-control. Against these things, these things are no, there is no law against any of these things, is there? We can live like that, or we can live the other way. But Paul himself said, be careful. If you bite each other, you're going to just eat each other alive. We've got to change the discourse in the world these days. We've got to learn to talk to people who disagree with us, not trying to fix them or correct them or slam them into submission, but to share with them what we know to be the truth of God and Jesus Christ. I don't say that Jesus is one truth among many. I believe that Jesus is the reason that the world is going to get to go back to God one of these days. I believe this is the reason that, that God created us and did not abandon us, so that Christ might come and live among us as one of us, to be tempted as we're tempted. Now, Jesus got angry sometimes. He wasn't meek in the sense of never stating what he truly believed. He didn't just bite his tongue in all situations. He spoke the truth in love to people, and we can learn to speak the truth in love. You don't have to say, for me, this is truth. You can say, this is the truth of God and Jesus Christ for the world. But you can love anybody who comes to Christ by any way they get there, instead of saying it's my way or the highway, and that's what we do too often. That's why we're using some of the hymns we're using today. More like you, Jesus, more like you. Fill my heart with your desire to make me more like you. Touch my lips with holy fire and make me more like you. Lord, you are my mercy. Lord, you are my grace. All my deepest sins have forever been erased. Draw me in your presence. Lead me in your ways. I long to bring you glory and righteousness and praise. And then we're going to do an old one soon. Some of you are going to like, you like old ones, right, Pete? You like old songs, old hymns? Yeah, he's smiling now. How about, I need thee every hour. Temptations lose their power when thou art nigh. If you're having a little trouble with self-control, and trust me, I'm on the top of that list. I need you every hour, most gracious God. I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. Bless me now, my Savior. I come to you. And then 
Our sending forth today is a newer one. Some of you might not like it, but it's easy to sing. To know you in all your glory, to love you with all that I am, with all my heart, Lord, this is my prayer, to know you more. The more we know God, the more we know Jesus Christ, the more we talk together, the more we study scripture together, the more we read the Bible, the more we pray in earnest to be changed ourselves, the more we'll see the world around us changing because we will then have an impact in the world. God is not Republican or Democrat. God is not independent or communist or socialist or anything else under the sun. God is God. Jesus Christ loves all of us equally calls all of us to his service, all of us to love one another as he has loved us. If we let the Spirit work within us, we will send out those things that will draw others to the truth of God by your patience, by your gentleness, your kindness, your self-control, your generosity, your faithfulness, your peace, and above all, your love will be a reflection of God's love alive in you and will draw folks to Christ. Live in a way that someone else says to you, I want what you have, I want it. And then share with them how to get it in the name of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen.